Many key scenes were shot in her absence, including entire sequences with the children. And Kathleen and Michael went to the ponies. My horse bit. You don't have a horse. She doesn't have a horse. That was good, except you didn't grab it early enough. Huh? When she, when she Child said, actors Alexandra Heilweil and Christopher Morley had a difficult time remembering their dialogue and staying focused. Cukor shot take after take with the children, occasionally losing his patience. Watch me to be surprised. Leave that alone. Come on now, watch me. 498. Speed. Let's do it once more, huh? Once more. That was very good without cutting. There is very good. Any... Come on. Hey, Never come mind. On. Come on, boys. Come on. All Leave right. it alone. And then watch me walk away. Watch me once more. Alexander, stop fussing with that, will you please? And watch me. On May 14th, Marilyn made her third appearance on the set. She was put to work opposite a very uncooperative dog and a very frustrated trainer. I start like... 382. Jeff, watch it. Jeff, speak. Jeff, speak. Speak. Speak for it. Come on, speak. Jeff, come on up here. Jeff, come on, Jeff. Here, watch it. Performing a welcome home scene over and over, it was the dog, not Monroe, who repeatedly Take missed that. cues and Jeff. required take Come after take. Come on. Come on, Jeff. Here, Jeff. Speak, boy. Speak. 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 Come on, Jeff. Get it. Speak. That's a boy. Here, Jeff. Well, uh, well. Casey's out of here. Jeff. 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 Come here. Come on. Get in here. Now, stay right there. Jeff, speak. Jeff. Speak! Come on, Jeff! Speak! Speak! Come on, here, boy! Come on, speak! Watch it! Speak! Speak for it! Speak! 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 Animals are never cooperative, except in rehearsals. A dog will react to a trainer perfectly all through the rehearsals. But the minute they hear a director say, action, the animal knows that they can get away with anything. But I remember the poor animal trainer uh, trying to get, trying to get it working. Well, I mean, we had her finally yeah, on the set. I mean, there were more that. interesting Please. things you could Please. do with Marilyn than shoot that dog. I just thought it was a waste, a terrible waste. The next two days rolled by without incident. Monroe showed up ready to work with her $5,000 a week acting coach, Paula Strasberg, in tow. Cukor finally had Marilyn present on the sound stage, but he could not command her undivided attention. You know, she was upstairs with her coach, with Paula, and she wouldn't come down if she didn't feel like she was ready for the scene, or she wouldn't come down. I think she had a lot of psychological problems. Marilyn had relied on Paula Strasberg's guidance during the production of her last five films. Paula had gained a reputation for quietly usurping any director's control over the star. A manner of working that made her universally unpopular on the set. She was heavier than I am. She wore, wore these black capes. She looked like Dracula's assistant. And she indulged Marilyn in all of this whims. You can't treat her this way. She's a great Hollywood star. Marilyn would look over to her for encouragement and for what to do. It was insidious. You know, and I think it hurt her very much. Every time she had to do something, she had to get Paula to tell her. Like we were doing the scene where Marilyn was supposed to walk down the steps near the swimming pool. Marilyn went up and down the stairs 10 or 12 times, and every time she would go up the stair, she would look at Paula, and if Paula said no, then she had to do it again. And I could see George just fuming and fuming and fuming. Cuckoo hated her, really hated her. I don't think they helped her at all. I think they just pumped her up full of lots of stuff so they could use her. But Paula Strasberg was not the only strong female in Monroe's entourage. Marilyn's publicist, Pat Newcomb, was also a presence in the actress's life. Pat Newcomb took control of Marilyn. Between Pat Newcomb and Paula Strasberg, Marilyn just 
She was like a caged animal. Nobody could get near her. Even if George Puker wanted to talk to her, you had to go through Pat Newcomb. Marilyn's distracted moods, during Something's Gotta Give, were also the result of a chaotic romantic life. Rumors flew about a flirtation with President John F. Kennedy and a more intense personal relationship with his younger brother, Bobby, who also happened to be the U.S. Attorney General. Well, over a period of time, I was not at all surprised that the Kennedys were a very important part of Marilyn's life. And uh, so that I was just a, I wasn't included in this information, but I was a witness to what was happening. I get a call from Marilyn one day. She says, I'm going to have a date with a very important man. And I really would like to know what questions to ask. I said, Marilyn, but who's the person I got to know? She says, it's Bobby Kennedy. So I said, you know, we're right in the middle of the civil rights situation. Ask him why he's not being more supportive of Martin Luther King. What are they doing to calm down these riots? You know? She says, well, how do I know which question? She says, it depends on his answer. So I said, well, let's rehearse. <laughs> Give me the question, answer, and then the next question we did that. A couple of days later, she says, I have another date. I said, well, how did the date go? She said, oh, it went very well. I said, now you could be more personal. And I don't hear from her for a week. So I call up and I said, Baron, how's it going? She says, I don't need any more questions. On May 15th, Marilyn reported to work despite complaining of a fever. We'd get reports from the psychiatrist. We'd get reports from the producer. And Marilyn had said this, and, oh, boy, she is coming in tomorrow. And if she did show up, it, you know, it was like the second coming. You know, everybody fell down and, and genuflected. Following several hours of makeup, Marilyn walked into the glare of the lights. Cucor filmed this scene, where after a long absence, Ellen Arden talks to her children, who fail to recognize her as their mother. Are you going to stay long? I don't know yet. Uh, would you like me to? I don't know where you sleep. I don't know either yet. But if that could be worked out, would you like me to stay? I would. You would? Uh, I wouldn't mind. Don't get me sick. <laughs> I guess you got your bed again. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right, well, okay. As I remember, there was a boy and a little girl, and even before we shot, she went and interacted with them to get them at ease so that she could play with them and everything. I remember that. It was hard because had her children lived, they would have been the same age as the children she worked with. The children loved her. She played with them, but yeah. it was sad. <laughs> Marilyn wanted children. She wanted them badly. Marilyn's own childhood had been riddled with painful experiences. Her biological father never recognized her as his own child. Her mother was put into a mental institution. And the young girl endured years of emotional, even sexual abuse, while growing up in a series of foster homes. Through her years of stardom, Marilyn had been quite open about her desire to have a child. But after several failed pregnancies, Monroe feared she could never have a baby of her own. After a while, even the sight of children reminded Marilyn of a painful void in her life. Jimmy, you hurt yourself. Michael. Marilyn had now been on the set eager to work for three days in a row. But early on Thursday, May 17th, it was learned that Monroe was going to take time off to attend President Kennedy's birthday gala in New York. Before production had begun, producer Henry Weinstein had given Marilyn his tentative approval. But now he had changed his mind. <laughs> 